This is my first piece of handmade Battenberg lace. It is 31 inches deep and 76 inches in circumference and is destined to be attached to a linen alb. I used 117 meters of tape and it took me 452 hours. Before starting, I had never done lace work before. In fact, at the start, I was accidentally calling it Guttenberg lace instead of Battenberg lace. The skills I had were what I learned last year for the hand embroidery of these chalice pools. Battenberg lace is a type of needlepoint lace. And as I found it hard to find all the information I needed in one place, I'm sharing this video, not as an expert, but to help those who are interested in learning Battenberg lace. I will go through all the steps with the lessons I learned along the way, and I will show how to do the 20 different stitches that I did in this piece, which are the same type of stitches for the other types of needlepoint laces. And so we begin. Pretty much everything I learned about Battenberg lace, I learned from this book from 1900 by Nellie Clark Brown, which I printed off the internet for free. I also found this other book, Madame Goubard's Point Lace Book, but I didn't find this as helpful in its explanations, but it does have good pictures. Um, but Nellie Clark Brown's book is better for explaining how to do the stitches, and this is basically how I learned how to do the lace. For the braid, um, the first thing you read in the Nellie Clark Brown's book, and every time I say the book, it means hers, um, the first thing you read in her book is this. Great care should be taken to avoid getting a cotton braid. The beauty and value of many a piece of Battenberg lace has been lessened because it was made with a cotton braid. Well, I looked and I looked and I looked, and I even wrote to a linen manufacturer in Ireland, but it seems no one makes Battenberg lace braid in linen anymore. So it leaves you with no option but to use a cotton braid. Uh, the braid I got was called Fancy Battenberg Lace, and I ordered it online from Claire's Lace in the UK. Um, it comes in 12 meter bundles and 50 meter bundles, and I got um, 50 meter bundles. So I used a pearl cotton and bright white. You can get plain white, um, but I got bright, bright white, which is number B2500. Um, in terms of thread size, for me, it was a toss up. Okay, so here I am with my cottons. I always assumed that the cotton I've been practicing with was number 12. I have just found out it's number eight. <laughs> Definitely number eight. Now the three sizes are actually here with this blue. I've got 12 on the top, where's my finger? 12 on the top, and then eight, and then five. Now five is definitely too big. So what I've got to decide now is between eight. Is that gonna focus? Between eight and twelve. There's not a huge difference, but there kind of is a difference. Um, in the end, I cho chose size 12, which is the narrowest of the pearl cotton range because I wanted to be able to do the small fine stitches in the smaller areas of the lace and I wanted the finer um, thread to be able to do that and have it very uh, quaint looking. When the tape arrived, I had no idea if it was pre-shrunk, so I cut a metre and I did a test of both the tape and the thread to shrink it and this is what happened they did shrink for sure. So it's really important if you're ever going to wash the lace in the future, and mine is going to be washed in the future, that you, um, you pre-shrink everything before you actually start working on your lace. For the thread to shrink it, I took out the label and I dunked the whole thing in boiling water until I was satisfied, like the whole ball in boiling water until I was satisfied that it was wet right through to the center. And then I um, dried it with a towel and left it to dry just sitting out for a few days. Um, the same with the braid, I put it in boiling water and then I pressed it with a towel and I ironed it flat again and because I had 50 meters I it took me about well 45 minutes close to an hour to actually iron that flat again. Um, 
and because I was using so much tape I put it on a roller and I found this really helpful so it just went straight from underneath the iron onto the the roll and that was an easier way to do it I thought. Tracing paper is essential for the design at least it was for me but I didn't like using it when I made my sampler for practicing the lace and the reason being that it ripped easily and it was noisy and awkward um, and in the end my lace was far too big for any tracing paper anyway so um, for the actual lace I used a light synthetic fabric for the pattern to trace onto I was able to see through it um, I don't know exactly what the, the fabric was we just call it drip dry here um, so I could see through it like tracing paper but it was huge and um, it obviously because it's fabric it stood up to a lot of handling and pin pricks so um, it worked out really well in Battenberg lace you have your pattern and then underneath the pattern you attach a backing fabric and I think this is to give the lace stability and also to protect the actual lace at the end when you turn it inside out and you cut out the basting stitches from the back um, so I used I attached my pattern to a dark linen so that I'd have sort of a darker fabric underneath my white lace for contrast but I definitely would not use that fine linen again because if anyone's worked with fine linen it can be quite hard to push your needle through um, for a small piece of lace it wouldn't matter but when you're spending hours pushing a needle through it makes a big difference so I've noticed in the book it says talks about um, Holland fabric or cambric fabric and I'm basically what I'm going to do for next time is look for a fabric that I can see through to put the pattern on but it's thick enough to like hold like not require backing fabric um, that's what I'm going for so I haven't discovered that yet but I'm gonna be doing that for next time this is my lace pillow I made it myself and um, a lace pillow is very very helpful when you are doing the lace stitches um, I made it I'll show you the inside but I made it so that I could put a pin right in and it would go all the way down um, but just so you can see what's inside actually I cut it smaller so my my bag on the outside is bigger um, than it needed to be so I'll just show you in here <clears throat> So we've just got layers of um, this fabric I found in the cupboard. So it just there's sort of like a sweater fabric. It's like a cotton. I don't know what you'd call that actually. And then at the very top I've got a blanket, um, an old blanket. And I so I just wrapped it tightly around this. That's um cut cut um you know the cardboard piping for a fabric roll. I cut it to the right size and then did that and then I, I made this little bag on the outside and so that as you'll see when I'm doing the stitches is very very helpful for when you're making lace um, and it's very firm and that's because when I stitched it up sorry I should have shown you that when I stitched up the final layer where is it there and I made sure when I was going along there it was pulled really tight so that's a lace pillow before explaining how I did my own design, I was very fortunate that before starting my lace, I managed to acquire two handmade Battenberg lace surpluses. I'm not sure what era they were made, but before the 1960s at least. It's a long story how that happened, but it was so helpful to study what the lace makers did, how their braid formed a pattern, how they turned corners, what the underneath side looked like, the stitches they chose for, chose for the different areas, and I'll show you a bit more of that when we get to the lace stitches. For my own design, I looked for inspiration from others' lace work or from significant symbols and artworks um, that were significant for the one I was making it for. Uh, for example, the frame of the cross came from an antique cross frame um, that this priest owns. The bottom design was based on one of St. Zaley Martin's lace designs, and I got the idea for the top border from a picture of lace I came across. A really helpful hint when you're making a repeating design of a pattern is to fold your tracing paper in half, design on one side of it, 
and then when you finish that fold it back in half and copy the design to the other side this ensures that the lines meet perfectly at the join of the pattern which is essential when you've got a repeating pattern you learn as you go and if you look closely at this picture here one of the earlier images of my pattern you'll notice that I changed the design of my vine from this the original leaves here were just far too small for the size of the tape and I didn't realize that until I started working with the tape for tracing the pattern onto the fabric, I uh, used a uh, Madame So iron out pen and it irons out perfectly 100% with an iron. The only thing about this red color which I used is that the red faded with time so that at some points it was actually hard to see. The black and the blue that came in the same packet didn't do that, didn't fade. So. Um, I would recommend the black and the blue if you're doing a big piece like I was. There were three reasons I chose to use a razable pen for my pattern. One, so that I could reuse the fabric with a new design next time. Two, so that if there was any transfer of the ink to the white lace, I could get it out easily. And three, I changed my pattern about three times after it was already drawn on and I was able to iron it out easily and redo it. But next time, I think I'd use permanent fabric marker. And I don't recommend a pencil because the lead can and does transfer to the lace. And it's hard to get out as I experienced when I was um, drawing in some lines for my lace stitches, which you'll see later. So you'll see here that I'm doing, I'm going over both the outer line and the inner line. Uh, in the future I won't do the inner line because it's really not essential. What you need when you're basting down your tape is the outer line of the design and that will make more sense as I explain the basting part. You can see that I've got pins holding my pattern from the pattern layer of fabric down through the pattern underneath and that's actually pinned onto an ironing table which I have in my office which is extremely helpful having a large ironing table for any sort of linen and uh, lace work. Also my tape was six millimeters wide so what I would do when I was doing my pattern was I would um, get the projector get that measurement and then I would go along the line that hadn't been done and it just made that uh, realistic to the, the width of the tape. That was very, very helpful. A final word in the preparation for the lace is the needles that you use. I'm not exactly sure the numbers and sizes of these needles, but the upper one uh, is a sharp needle, sharp needle, and I use that for the basting and the overcasting. The lower needle is a blunt needle. It's got a big eye, and I use that with the pearl cotton for my lace stitches. Basting is basically a running stitch. The book says the basting stitches should be rather close and short and should be drawn tightly so as to hold the braid firmly to its place. Um, I found it very good to use a coloured thread because it's easier to see later when it's removed at the end. And I used a polyester thread because polyester is stronger than cotton. Um, the main thing to note when you baste the braid down is that you always follow the outer edge of the braid and sew it down against the line. So if the curve changes direction and the outer curve becomes the inner curve, then you cross over to the other side and continue basting along the outer edge. The only time you can safely go through the middle of the braid is on a straight run of braid. For me, after I'd already spent hours basting the braid down, I realized that I could have used a sewing machine to do the straight stretches of tape. I did trial using the machine for the lower part of the pattern, which had a very mild curve to it, and it turned out just fine. But I would definitely not use the sewing machine for the parts of the pattern and basting of the braid where there are frequent turns and curves because the machine would be more of a nuisance than a help in getting the tape in the right position. And when you start a new braid or when you join two ends of the braid together, 
You want to do that when the braid crosses over on the pattern so that you hide the join where possible. The book recommends folding one braid up and the other connecting braid down and sewing them together, but I actually found this quite messy because I didn't want a big fold, but the little fold would unravel very easily as soon as I started trying to sew one to the other. So what I did is before I even started basting down a new braid, I folded over the end and secured it with um, the thread I was going to use for my overcasting, not the colored thread, but the overcasting thread. Um, and to save time later, what I did was I temporarily pulled it through to the other side of the fabric, the material, so that later on when I began overcasting, I could bring it up again and continue on from that end point. When you get to a corner or point when you're basting, make sure that the point is secured down. The book says to go beyond the point with a couple of stitches so that the braid doesn't stick up and cause problems later with catching the lace thread, which is a nuisance. But I actually found uh, it wasn't necessary to do this, as on a big piece of lace, there are so many things for the thread to catch on, as you'll see later, that it doesn't matter and you get adept at manoeuvring your thread to avoid that happening. Also, there's different ways that the book offers to make your mitered corner or your corners, your points and your corners. Um, I found in the end the simplest way was literally to just follow the line of the pattern, go to the edge and keep going. And when it came to overcasting and folding it down, it just sort of naturally, I just did it. And if I needed to fold, tuck more under, I did, um, just to make a neat corner. So I just did simple folds rather than the mitered folds of the book, and that's what I pretty much did all the way around my work. I don't have any video footage of when I did this, but when your braid um, turns back upon itself, and the book it talks about scallops and loops, you don't need to cut it. So I'll just show you the direction I went with this braid. I went up over here to this point. I came down and I went all the way over here to that point. And when I came back, I went right down to that edge und underneath and then I folded it and then I headed up and I did the same thing all the way. Now, doing the folding underneath means that you don't need to cut the braid and that's, you don't want, to, you want to cut the braid as little as possible. So this is the, this is the way to do it. The next step is overcasting the braid. And this is very time consuming, but it's necessary because you'll notice that when you baste down the braid on curves, the inner edge sticks up. That's what needs to be drawn down flat. You also need to connect two braids when they meet and sew down corners. So that's what the overcasting does. For the overcasting, I used a white cotton covered polyester thread because it needs to be thin, but I found thin cotton thread on its own wasn't strong enough. And polyester thread would be fine, but the cotton covered polyester thread has the benefit of strength inside and the beautiful cotton shine on the outside in keeping with the cotton look. Although to be honest, this isn't notice noticeable to anyone except the lace maker. The book says, the overcasting thread should pass over and over the edge of the braid and into each of its marginal loops. Only occasionally, on very large, slightly curved lines, may a loop be here and there omitted. For me, I'd go along about one to two centimetres or an inch and then I would pull the curve flat. If you leave it too long, you find that it gets the thread gets stuck in the edge of the braid and it doesn't pull flat. The book continues, whenever the overcasting thread reaches a place where two edges of the braid meet or cross, the needle should be passed through both braids, either in a simple overcasting stitch or with a single buttonhole knot. When the thread passes from one side to the other of two braid edges, the thread should also connect them at both sides. So as you can see here, I have just connected um, that uh, curved braid to the um, curve of the lower petal, if you like, 
and I'm overcasting it along that edge until I meet the corner of the new petal and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back uh, so there I'm doing just to strengthen it I'm about to do a buttonhole knot that's at the very that's at the beginning of the new petal but I'm going to head back now and I'm going to catch the fold um, the reason why I didn't catch the fold going along the first time was because I have to go back anyway and catch the other fold um, which you'll see in a second uh, and secure this this part of the fold down of that point and when I get to um, the corner that I'm heading to it now the inner corner I need to secure that well because that's the outer edge of that uh, flower and it's this work um, of overcasting and the lace work that actually holds your piece together so the lace stitches on their own are not going to hold your braid together you've got to have the braid firmly fixed to its place before you start the lace work and this is what this overcasting work does when it comes to fastening the thread the book says that knots should never appear in any lace okay so here are my thoughts about that cotton is softer than linen and therefore it's slipperier and while many lace pieces are made for a surface of some kind and don't move the alb which I was making is made to be worn and therefore has to withstand quite a bit of movement so I tried the book method of weaving the thread ends in small stitches so that it would be uh, so that it couldn't be seen but I found that they just kind of slipped out um, so what consoled me in deciding to use knots was that the lace makers who made the two surpluses I got I found that I saw that they both tied knots at the back of their work and they were very good lace makers as you can see from their stitches and so that gave me confidence to do the same Nellie Clark Brown in the book highly recommends preparing a sampler before you begin your lace and that's when you discover it's not as easy as it looks but you quickly get the hang of things so don't worry you can lay down the braid in lines to make squares like in the book but I was eager to practice laying down the braid like I would in the real pattern so I started with this practice pattern I found on the internet and I was still waiting for the lace braid to arrive from the UK so I used plain tape the first problem I ran, ran into here was finding that because my braid was ever so slightly thicker than the pattern the spaces were too small to practice practice the lace stitches in this is where I also found that using tracing paper for the design was going to drive me nuts as I explained earlier about using tracing paper next for the next sampler I switched to using interfacing for the pattern and used the machine to lay the braid down in any which way because I wanted to practice lace stitches at that point I used interfacing instead of tracing paper but I found it quite hopeless because the fibers easily catch on the needle and also catch the thread also I found with time it wouldn't have had the strength to withstand all the handling of the lace over the months I was going to be working on it my third sampler was using the actual lace braid and some elements from my own original design and here I learned more by mistake the points of my cross and the fleur de -lis were too small which meant having to address adjust the original pattern anyway having done these samplers and played around a bit and without any more practice I started the lace in terms of where to start the book says all patterns should be able to be considered as composed of two parts design and background the design should be prominently brought out and to accomplish this the network and other showy stitches should be used keeping the wheels bars and other open stitches for the background and here's the important part it is well to put in the background stitches first as they will hold the curves of the braid in place and preserve the shape of the design until the work is finished so according to the book there are four different categories of lace stitches there's the bars 
There's wheels or spiders. There are insertions. And finally, the network stitches, which have the greatest variety. So I will go for the 20 stitches that I did in this piece of lace, I will go pretty much in the order that I did them. The Sorrento bars, or the plain twisted Sorrento bar, is the simplest of all the stitches. And as you can see in the picture here, uh, what you do is you literally go from one side, one braid, across to the other side, you go through the edge of that braid and then you twist the thread over and over or round and round again until you get back to the first side and then you overcast down the braid and then do that again. The reason why I'm showing you here on this picture is that I did it slightly differently. Mine are not separated um, like in this picture. I did mine continuously. So here I've just finished doing one of the spider wheels or wheels and I'll show you that in a little bit but then after I've finished the wheel I continue on through that narrow space by doing a Sorrento bar and as you'll see I go when I finish one I'm about to finish it now I head off to do the next one so my Sorrento bars are zigzagged they're not um, parallel lines and because I was there I go again I'm going to the next one. So what I did, because I did such a large area of Sorrento bars, is with one thread, one continuous thread, I just literally zigzagged my way around the pattern where I was doing the Sorrento bars. Only when I hit a dead end or a crevice did I go over to it and then I overcast back and continue on with my single layer of thread. As you can see here, I've already got my first sort of round of single layer thread for the Sorrento bars zigzagging through the pattern. And now I'm going over it the exact same way, but overcasting it over that original thread that I went around with first time. Um, I usually did, depending on the size of the space, I went about three or four times around the thread and very small gaps, it was just once or twice. A final thing to note when you're overcasting your Sorrento bars this way is that you have to remember to always go into the braid when you reach each edge or each end of the bar. If you forget to do that and you go from one bar directly to another bar without entering the braid, you'll notice and it will be very obvious to you. The double twisted Sorrento bar, according to the book, is formed by casting three threads across the space to be filled. These threads are stretched just sufficiently to cause them to lie in a straight line between the braids without pulling them from their places. They are then overcast together in an open effect that allows the foundation threads to show between the coiling of the overcasting thread, which winds around them like a tendril. So it's basically a simple Sorrento bar, except you go across three times, and when you come back the fourth time, you overcast. And I usually did three overcasting, because as it says, you want to, part of the, uh, the bar, the official way of doing it is to show those threads underneath. And then because I wasn't zigzagging, I was just doing individual bars, you have to overcast between your bars. According to the book, and I do it differently, so I'm going to explain the book method first. The wheels are formed by wherever you start your thread, you go all the way across and then all the way back like you would with a Sorrento bar. And then you overcast around, all the way across, all the way back. Overcast to the next one, all the way across, all the way back. And then when you get to your final one, so that there's the final one, and you're coming back, before you head right back, you weave in and out around these, and you form that circle in the middle by weaving over and under, over and under, over and under. And then when you've got the size that you want, you catch the last two threads on this side before you head out. 
Now I'm going to show you that the way that I did it, which is slightly differently, and it might be a bit clearer. Wheels form a big part of the background of my uh, piece of lace, and they're quite fun to do, they're quick to do, relatively quick. And according to the book, you go from one side and you overcast all the way back to the other side. And I ex just explained that I found a different method, a slightly quicker method, and that's to put a pin in where my, uh, the middle of my wheel was going to be. And I went back and forth from that pin. So the pin was holding the thread in the middle when I went to another side. Uh, so I'd go out, no longer in a diameter, but a radius. I'd go out and I'd overcast back to the middle. What I'm doing right here is just filling in that little corner spot, um, which needs a bit of uh, Sorrento bars to hold it all in place. So I'm going, what you do when you use the pin method is you do everything you need to do at the point of the points of the radius or the outer points of the radius, the circumference points, and then you come back to the pin and you don't go back there again. So you do what you need to do when you're out there, if that makes sense. So now I'm heading back towards my, overcasting back towards my wheel. You've got to remember when you're overcasting, you've always got to go back into the braid before you um, go from one overcasting thread to another. So here I'm going back to the middle of my wheel and I will head off to another side when I'm satisfied that I've got enough, uh, I've been around the thread enough times to overcast it and hold it tight. So I'm deciding the best place to go, going straight across. So you just keep doing that to form your wheel. You go out to one side, back to the middle, and using the pin, you it, it's held in the center, holding it in the center and then heading off to another side. I'm about to do two in this space, which is why I'm showing you here, uh, and which is why that wheel looks like it's not centered in the space. I'm going to do two in this space. So I have now formed all the different points of my wheel, and I'm going to form the wheel of the wheel. If, uh, so you go under and over, under and over around the middle. It's helpful when you have an odd number. And you keep going round and round until it's the size that you want. Now I'm doing this now. This is my first round of um, Sorrento bars with wheels. But because this is an outer uh, wheel, I'm not going to be coming back to this spot. I'm doing the, the rosette in the middle now. Because I'm about to make another one beside it. And it's that one that will... Um, have its rosette done later on the second round of Sorrento bars, if that makes sense. Sorry, it's easier to show than explain sometimes. So now I catch the two outer threads of that inner wheel and that secures that wheel in place and then I start heading over to my second wheel and again I'm going to use the pin just like I did for this, this one. I'm going to use the pin for the middle of that second wheel and repeat the same process. The only difference being that that bar, that first thread that goes onto the wheel, or both wheels, is going to be left without overcasting. Because when I come through with my overcasting thread for the Sorrento bars, I will overcast that on, and then I will overcast off. So the wheel will be half complete, or three quarters complete. It'll just need its um, thing in the middle, which I showed before. Now I'm about to finish that and I'm heading off without overcasting that final off thread because that will be done later. And I continue on with the Sorrento bars.
According to the book, the plain Russian stitch is the simplest of the insertions and, like all insertions, is suitable for long, narrow spaces in the design of the pattern. This is accomplished by a series of buttonhole stitches alternating from one side of the space to the other. And you'll notice there, and I had to think about this every time I did it, whether I was going up or down, you make your stitch and you hold the thread, um, you go over the thread in the direction you're heading. It's hard to explain, but um, see how I'm holding that down? I'm doing a buttonhole stitch and then pulling it through. And that's holding, that's creating the Russian stitch. Whenever you finish an area that you're filling, you can either tie off on a knot on the edge of the braid, not ideal, but you do it as tightly and securely and discreetly as possible, or you can head off to another area if you've got enough thread, and that's what I'm about to do here. The book calls the small the insertion with small wheels a very pretty stitch and I think it is and you first you fill the space first with plain Russian stitch and to determine the spacing of that I chose to do half inch um, gaps between where I would make my Russian stitches as a guide um, you don't have to do those dots but they were very very helpful and I wanted to do it all in one go without having to cut my thread so I realized or I discovered that if I went along the space three times then I would have sufficient uh, length of thread to complete that stitch with Russian stitch which we'll now show you so using the dots as a guide, and excuse the paint on my hands, you make plain Russian stitch, but you're doing it with quite big spaces in between, and it seems kind of ridiculously huge spaces at this point, but you're going to come back in the other direction um, in every other space, so you'll see that shortly. But for now, you just go down that space with plain Russian stitch. When you get to the other end, you turn around and you go back the opposite direction doing the exact same thing in the spaces between. So on the opposite side where there's a space, you do your Russian stitch all the way down to the other end. When you've reached the other end, you go to the middle of the space so you're not on the sides anymore, you're in the middle of the space that you'll go down and you begin making your wheels. And I'm going to skip this first wheel because it doesn't actually have five prongs. And go to the second wheel. So to make the wheel, the book says you don't need to make a knot when you reach that intersection of the Russian stitch. You just start going around and there'll be five threads that you're going around which means that you're creating an even basket weave and I think I went around three times um, in this space I suppose if it was a bigger space you'd go around more times but I think I went around three while I'm doing that you'll notice on the side there there's a orange pin um, and at this point in my lace making I was pinning the lace to the lace pillow to hold it tight but I found after a while because my lace was so big I didn't need to do that it sort of held itself to the lace pillow but if you're doing a smaller work you would want to hold your lace to the pillow with pins um, they're annoying because they catch the thread as there are a number of things that can catch the thread you've just got to watch out for it so when you've gone around the number of times you want to go around you go into the center 
or at least catch a couple of the threads and you pull it through and then you go down and start the next one and all the way down to the very end. This is the cluster insertion and according to the book it says this is one of the most charming and useful of the insertions and the ease with which it is made increases its popularity. It is equally appropriate for straight or curved spaces. Two twisted parallel bars are worked and the thread for the third bar carried across and overcast nearly to the middle. Where the three, when the three bars, two twisted and one incomplete, are joined by fine, tight buttonhole stitches worked over them close together. The twisting of the third bar is then completed. The first and third bars of each group should be just loose or slack enough to admit of their being fastened by the buttonhole stitches to the middle bar without drawing the blade braid out of place. The first bar of each succeeding trio should be placed close to the last bar of the preceding group. Uh, so that's the explanation from the book. Um, something I did that was uh, a bit of a, well, a learning curve is that I did not leave enough slack in my uh, upper and lower bars. And so when I pulled the three together with the buttonhole stitches it kind of pulled the braid and it seemed fine enough at the time because um, the fabric underneath the pattern kind of buckled and it, you know being fabric it moved and that was fine but it definitely took uh, some of the the depth of my whole pattern like it was supposed to be 40, 34 inches and it ended up being less than that because uh, in this area at least my bars were drawn too tight. Um, having said that, uh, nobody else would know that but me. So here I'm about to form the buttonhole stitches. So I've overcast halfway through that third one and I'm doing my first buttonhole stitch. It doesn't say in the book how many to do, but I chose to do three. So pull it tight, then a second buttonhole stitch. Going right behind the three of them, pull it tight. And then the third buttonhole stitch and when that one's finished you overcast off that third bar back to the side there is another method of making these um, this stitch but it actually ends up looking a little bit similar to the one beside it here the um, plain the twisted small sorry the small wheel insertion. Um, the way of forming that, according to what I could see on the lace makers who had done the, um, the surpluses, is that they went from one braid across to the other, overcast down, came across, overcast down, came across. So they form three single layer threads and they continue to do the, those groups of three and then at the very end, they kind of did what you do in the small wheels, which is um, from the middle of the braid, um, like the intersection kind of part, you then head up and form three buttonhole stitches or the buttonhole stitches, kind of like you do the small wheels. That would definitely be a faster way to do it, but I chose not to do that simply because it looked too similar to uh, the small wheel insertion and I wanted to I actually thought that the way that the book recommended for this or suggested it's quite uh, it is very pretty and it's got a thickness to it when you do it the way that the book suggests so that's what I did according to the book the insertion with branches are especially appropriate for oval or leaf shaped openings so with your working thread at the bottom of the space, you go to the top and from the top of the braid, you gather a few stitches. I've got a few millimeters there and you go from the top. You don't go from underneath the braid and form that um, 
sort of oval shaped gathering and then you go to the other side of the braid a little bit further down without having done anything else with the thread and do the same. So that's on my left side and then on my right side I'm going to do the same. Gather a few stitches from the top and then go back to the center. And at this point you want to make a buttonhole knot gathering all those kind of loose threads in one. So I'm making the buttonhole knot. Now at this point you can go to the next one. Um, that's one type of insertion with branches, but I made little um, rosettes. And so I went round twice. I probably could have gone round three times to make it more of an um, obvious circle there but I went round twice that secures that branch cluster better and then I went round down to the second one so the same thing again this time you're just missing the top just doing two branches on the sides go from the top gather some stitches and back to the middle and the same thing again, a buttonhole knot with all those threads. When you go round to form the rosette, you always go underneath that vertical and over the leaves, over the horizontal, so under and over. Okay, I think I'm going to go around once there. I probably could have gone around twice. And then I'm going to form one more in that space. That's the same thing again. These are very quick to do and they're quite pretty. Um, I think if my space was a bit bigger, I would have done a bigger rosette in the middle and they would be prettier still. So it's a very nice quaint stitch to do. So under the vertical, the single, and then over the double branches, under. And then straight down to finish. The book says that an insertion with leaves and darning stitch is excellent where a heavy, rich effect is desired. This is very similar in some ways to the previous stitch, except you start at the top, as you can see, and then go to the bottom of the area that you're going to fill, back to the top, because in going back and forward, and you'll do it again, up and down from, from side to side, um, it gives a base for the darning which you will soon start doing so you've gone down and up and then this time you don't catch as many stitches when you do that um, when you go to the side just to the book says just a couple but just a very small amount then you go to the other side exactly where that side was now something I did not do well in mine don't follow my example is that I didn't give a very leaf effect mine sort of weren't angled enough and this is an error I just was um, not observant enough. I could have done that, but I could have, I think now you do the buttonhole stitch. Yes, and this is where I should have drawn it lower so that the leaves were kind of sitting lower. I do try, but um, for the most part, my leaf insertions were, the leaves were very straight <laughs> rather than angled. You go back to the top and go down again. Now this up and down is in order to create that more solid filling when you do the darning stitch. So now I'm about to start the darning stitch. So there's five threads going up and down there. So I will start darning with three on one side and two on the other. 
you could probably done from the bottom up but I found going from the top down easier so I went down into the middle and separated two stitches on one side three on the other and then when that when you've done those first two and separated them it's much easier to go into the middle space and you literally done going in and out to each side all the way down all the way down I've now reached the bottom of that first petal and you just go in to the bottom somewhere in the middle of all those threads so that it holds and you go out to the side and as you did for the top one you go back to the middle I never quite figured out where it was best to go back to the middle sometimes I went in the middle sometimes I went over the side but in any case you want to catch the thread um, in those middle threads in that sort of knot area so now I start my darning so there's now five threads over there that I'm darning on and you go back to the middle the same and then across to the other side the same When you've finished darning the top area you're ready to start your second set of petals and it's literally just the same as you did at the top you're going from the middle top or the leaves above catching a couple threads on the side going to the other side and then coming back to the middle exactly as you did above and when you form your buttonhole knot in the middle of it all to hold it you then go back up to that first lot the first um, set of leaves and you uh, go back and down again so always with this stitch you're wanting to create or provide enough um, threads underneath to provide a, a heavier base or a more um, solid filling for your darning so in that manner you continue on for the leaf insertion now we begin the network stitches and this single net stitch or Brussels point is the foundation of many of the other network stitches so you'll notice because I'm starting I'm pulling my knot through from underneath um, but that's just because I'm starting and I'm also reinforcing as I went along I realized that um, it was a good idea to reinforce that first sort of hold the knot in place better by going around the braid again that's optional I did it it's not necessary but um, just gives strength to the work so um, I'll explain here what the book says the beauty of this stitch lies in the evenness and regularity of the stitches it consists of rows of buttonhole stitches worked loosely the loops should be all of the same length and the buttonhole stitches must fall in even lines forming parallel diagonal lines from the upper left to the lower right and vice versa so this stitch actually what I'm going to fill in this area is another type of Brussels point but the foundation is the single net stitch of Brussels point so very simply it's a buttonhole stitch from the top always from the top going down and if you're working in that direction I can't I'm upside down here but you've always got your thread to the side of the you've got your loop of thread to the side that you're heading in so I've got it there going to my right if I was heading in the other direction it would be on the other side so it's very very simple just go down into the top braid or if you're on the next line into the top above the stitches and you're not going underneath in other words and you just do that all the way along now this very very simple stitch can seem intimidating if you're 
beginning with lace, but you get the hang of it quite quickly in terms of making it more regular. These were easier to be regular because they're so small. Some of my buttonhole stitches were bigger than this, but when they're small, see how that's catching? There's so many things on a lace piece that your thread can catch on, which is why I didn't worry too much about pins and the points of, um, of the areas that were sticking up. It just, there were so many areas sticking up. So I went all the way along with a single net stitch Brussels point. When you reach the other side, you enter the braid of the other side at the same level as the lower loops. So I've just done that and it's not easy to see because it's such a tiny, the braid comes up in such a, on that angle, it's not coming up parallel. So you always enter the braid when you hit the other side from underneath. You don't go over into it from above, you go into it from below. Now I'm about to undo this, which is why I haven't started explaining heading back in the other direction. So when you've gone to the other side in the braid, you go underneath at the level of the lower loops and then you overcast down. You overcast down, I'm just doing that now. The, the, the size of the next row of loops and then you just start heading off in the other direction. So you're doing the same thing but in the opposite way. So the loop is forming on your, well it's my left side, yeah. Notice that again, like I was at the top, I'm going from above down into the loop above. I'm counting because of the stitch that I'm about to form here. I have to skip one there. So the book says about this stitch, the worker should never attempt to retain the same number of stitches in every row throughout an irregular space, which is mine. The space must regulate the number of stitches and accommodate only just so many as there is room for when keeping them at their regular size. The book also says this stitch may be made with large open loops, giving a very open lacy effect, or the loops may be made small and consequently the work much more close in appearance. So that is the that's the basics of the single net stitch. There are all sorts of variations with Brussels point. And one of the ones that I did was a Brussels point in triangles. And this is formed using a single stitch, the Brussels net stitch, but skipping a stitch or two stitches or three stitches or four in each row. And that's what's forming those lines. In the last row of the stitches where I, um, I have another new row starting again, it's, it's sort of being sagged down by the five net stitches in that space and I don't know that that's avoidable because I did have it very very tight it just pulls so I will go now and show you um, how I formed that stitch so this is my second row uh, we saw before the single net stitch all the way across this is a second row and I'm going along and doing four buttonhole stitches and then skipping the fifth four and then skipping the fifth this is now, I've jumped to the third row. So in this one, I'll be doing three buttonhole stitches and skipping, and then three and then skipping. Now I'm doing the third buttonhole stitch and then I will skip. So I've just done three buttonhole stitches and I'm gonna skip. Now, um, I'm just putting that there just to help hold that loop in place. So I'm skipping now. So you're only skipping one stitch actually, but it's a very wide stitch. It's the, the, um, the jump of the row above. Here I am at the fourth row, and this time you go two stitches and then skip, and then two stitches and then skip. It gets easier at this point. You're no longer counting because it's pretty obvious where you're skipping and where you're doing your buttonhole stitches. What gets a little bit trickier is the tension. Um, you wanna keep that tight. Actually, the reason why I've got the pin over on that other side is not so much um, to keep it in place, but because this stitch has a tendency to curl 
and it can be quite messy looking when you're doing it but as with all the net stitches you see the you see the evenness and the regularity of it when you put in your final row you kind of draw it all down into place and you'll see that I'll get to that at some point with these net stitch series This is now the next row and you're making an even bigger jump again. This time you're doing two buttonhole stitches but they're forming only one loop between the big gaps. So this is the second to final row because that loop I've just formed will be the one thing that you latch onto in your next row. So now the triangles are pretty obvious and looking quite pretty. So here I am starting the last final row and I've only just realized as I'm recording this that I made a mistake here and I forgot the final row. So see how I'm holding across the thread like that? That's to just determine the width of the next row. So I should have gone into those single loops all the way across but I actually started uh, the next row, like started the new, the new lot of triangles. So the way that you do that is you do single net stitches into the big gap and you do five because ultimately five are what you've jumped from above. So when you've done that, you're back to the number you started with. Um, if this was an even space, it would be the same, but it's not an even space. But you do five buttonhole stitches in those gaps. The book says, one of the prettiest of all arrangements of the Brussels net stitches is the one commonly known as the P-stitch because of the open P-shaped spaces forming, formed by the method of grouping the stitches. The stitch is excellent for the filling in with networks of large spaces and belongs to the design stitches and not to the background stitches. The stitch begins with a row along the upper braid of single Brussels net stitch or just single net stitch my area is quite small and the thing about this stitch is you've got to be quite mentally alert it's almost I don't know how well I'm going to explain it because the counting and the placement of the stitches can get confusing as you go but it's worth persevering through that so I'm just finishing here the first row of single Brussels net stitch that'll be the last one I think So because it's curved at the very top, I've tried, I'm just making sure that that row is even along the bottom. Then I'm finishing the row by going into the braid at the edge. And I'll now overcast down to the next row of stitches. To form the P-stitch in the second row, you do two net stitches and then you do a large stitch skipping two. The thing is, because the space is not very big, I end up only doing one stitch and then skipping two. Um, so there's my P-stitch there and I'm going to ensure that its tension is good by putting in a pin, holding it in place, otherwise I could pull it tight again. I want it to be down like that. I'm going to show you a bit further on so that you can get a better idea of the rows of the P-stitch. So here we are further down and as you can see I'm using pins for each of my P's if I can put it that way. So when it's P-stitch is essentially two rows even though it looks like more than two rows. Um, when you've finished a row of P-stitch, you do three buttonhole stitches in each of the P's. And one buttonhole stitch in between. So I've just done three, three stitches there. Now I'll do three more in the next P. So you're doing three stitches in the P's and one in between. Three, one, and that's all the way along. So here I'm about to begin 
the second row of P stitch. Now I'm saying the second row because it's underneath the row of single Brussels net stitch, which are made upon the P stitches of the row above. So here's row number two. And so for the second row of P stitch, you do two leap loops and then you skip two, two and then skip two. So the thing about this now is that you're always skipping two as in you're making the P in between your above P stitches. So that's why you've got to keep kind of calculating. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's an enjoyable one. So there I'm forming a P stitch. See how it's not directly underneath. It's sort of, it's in the alternate space. Now I'll do two small stitches, buttonhole knit stitches. Oh no, I just skipped. I just did a P stitch. Okay, I don't know why, sorry. I think because again, the other one was against the side, so you didn't see the second stitch. Um, Oh no, it is, it was, sorry, it was two. This is where it gets confusing. It was two, but it creates two buttonhole stitches create only one loop. So here's my second buttonhole stitch, but it's created only one loop. So two buttonhole stitches creating a small loop, skip two, which creates a big loop. There's another P-stitch. So sorry, I can't explain it any better than that. Uh, <laughs> But it's worthwhile if you want to do this stitch because it does look very pretty. The double knit stitch is quite simply two knit stitches in one. So in the loop above or in the braid above, you do two buttonhole stitches and the second stitch is drawn tight so that it holds. And because you're drawing that second stitch tight, I did what I just did, which is I put the needle in the loop and held it so that it didn't get pulled tight as well. So one and then two buttonhole stitches. And then I would optionally, but I would hold that loop just and then tighten my two buttonhole stitches together. The book says that this stitch, while taking twice as long as a single net stitch, is more easily made perfect as the two stitches aid in keeping the work firm and true. This is one of the most satisfactory of the net stitches, and it is because it doesn't, you don't have any problems with tension with this stitch. The last of the Brussels net stitches or single net stitches series I'm going to show is called the Venetian stitch. Um, it's part of this series because it's formed in the same way, a single button hole net stitch. The difference between this double Venetian and uh, the double net stitch is that when you get to the end of your row going from left to right, you don't go back in the same direction in the other direction, you go in a line. So I'll show you that when we get there. So here I'm doing two buttonhole stitches along the top. That first loop is very shallow because of the angle of the, um, of the large oval I'm doing it in. But I've drawn lines in as a guide and I discovered when I was doing this stitch, it's very helpful to have lines in because it's easy to go wonky in this stitch and be uneven. And it could just be because I was working in a large space, but certainly having lines for this particular stitch was very helpful. I form those lines by rolling one centimeter spaces down through my design. So you do a row of double net stitch. And at the end of that row of double net stitch, so I'm doing the last double and hold my stitch at the line and tighten the double buttonhole stitches so I go into the end where the line is. It's a very small loop, shallow loop there because of that angle. And now you go all the way back to the other side 
and that's what makes Venetian stitch different from the double knit stitch or double Brussels. So go straight into the stitch from the first stitch, you're going back along that line and now you go down to your second row. I could have overcast twice there, but I, it was probably sheer laziness that I just did one overcast. So when you do your second row, now going back into the uh, row above, just going into the braid there, you go not only into the loop above, but you also catch that, that line, that thread line. So catch both the line of thread and the loop above with your double buttonhole stitches. And that is how you do Venetian stitch. Spanish point has a longer effect than the Brussels net stitch. And instead of forming the sort of loopy effect, it's got more of a rectangular effect. In some ways it's more stable and easier to work with in the Brussels net stitch. So the way that you form Spanish point is, um, well, first of all, because this is a pointed space that I'm starting in, I'm going to create a little loop, which has nothing to do with the stitch itself. I'm just going to go from one side to the other so that I have something to hang my stitches on. I could go up into the point, but it's just it's just hard. And I learned this from the lace makers who did the surpluses. So I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna go down further than I would a Brussels knit stitch. Go into the braid. I'm about to form the first Spanish point stitch. I could not for the life of me understand how to do this in the book. Something about going around the thumb and all sorts of things like that. So what you do is you form a loop below to in the direction that you're going. Take it across and then you go under and then over the middle one and under the bottom one. I'll do that again. So you form a loop by having that thing go there, <laughs> the thread go that way, and then go the other way. Both ways are beneath your loop, bu loop above. And then you go under, over, and under. And notice that I'm holding the thread steady by putting my needle up in that the upper part of the Spanish loop. I found that just it helped to stabilize the stitch um, otherwise it can kind of pull out of place. It's not something that you have to do but I found it very handy to quickly create my stitches. So that's enough for that space. I'm now going to go into the edge now, if you were to go down and form another row in the other direction, it would be called open Spanish point. But this is not open Spanish point, but just Spanish point. And Spanish point, which we're doing here, instead of going down and making another row here, you actually overcast through your loops back to your starting place. So you go once through each loop. back to your starting place. And you go in the braid from where you came from. That's important. You can't just go down to the next row yet. You've got to go into the braid there. And then you overcast down and do another row.
and this time you are doing one Spanish point, Spanish net stitch in each of the loops above. And that is Spanish point. When you get to the bottom of the space that you're going to fill, and this is applicable to all of the net stitches, uh, you have a number of options. One is that you can go along and um, do your stitches as normal and then when you go back over casting you catch the bottom braid every time you go over but that's not what I'm going to do here what I decided to do here was and certainly over here where I've got not much space between the braid and the stitches I'm just going to do the stitch but I'm going to go directly into the braid under the stitch so you do your over under over um, but you're catching the braid each time and uh for some reason my leaf is kind of in a funny shape at the bottom and I thought that I would be doing this only over this side but in the end I did it all the way over. So you're just catching the braid at the bottom every time you go and this is one way that you can finish your uh, stitching area. So I'm about to finish, I'm on the last stitch of this area. And the way that I would finish my areas, because I could not get underneath the braid to tie my knots, I did them on the edge of the braid. So I'm about to do that now. I was deciding whether I should go on that last one, but the last one is secured anyway. So here I'm about to do a knot. And what I, I did various, I tried various things. I'm not sure what works best, but here I'm gonna go through twice. And really try and secure that knot and when I do this with the scissors before I cut I also push down with the scissors so I'm pushing right against the knot sort of getting the thread as tight as I can the first thing to say about triple Spanish point and I've only just realized this as I'm studying again the book to make this video is that the triple Spanish point is categorized underneath the Spanish net stitches on all the pages of the Spanish stitches. But looking more closely, I can see that there is a, another twist or two in the Spanish net stitches compared to the Spanish point stitches. So I've kind of contrasted them here a bit awkwardly in this image. Uh, the thing is, Nellie Clark Brown doesn't say anything about a different way of creating the stitch. So I don't know if it's her error and oversight and not explaining how to do the Spanish net stitch, if it's different, or if it's the artist's um, error in creating too many little twists in that picture. I'm not exactly sure. But in any case, my Spanish net stitches, in this case the triple Spanish net, is made using Spanish point. Um, someone out there might know if there is a difference between them, but uh, for me, for what I'm going to show here, it's just the continuation of the Spanish point, but um, grouped differently. Um, and there's lots of variations which make the stitch really cool to work with. So here we are with the triple Spanish net stitch or triple Spanish point. Um, as you can see, my stitches are not entirely parallel. Uh, there's a bit of wonkiness to them, but like with handmade lace, it gives it character. Um, so you're simply here doing, in this triple one, doing three stitches and then you're jumping three. Doing three, jumping three, and then the next row down, you do your three stitches in the alternating spaces. Um, there's so many variations of Spanish point and this is a, I find particularly pretty one. So I'm doing my three stitches there. And then I will jump, leaving a bar gap that will accommodate three stitches below. The thing about that jump, that bar that you're leaving the space, is that you don't want it to be too sort of slack or loopy because um, when you overcast back from the other side, it will get, it will sort of be 
there'll be excessive thread there if you have too much of a loop. The thing about the Spanish stitches is that when you form them, especially with the cotton, the pearl cotton, there's sort of quite a loop at the bottom and you don't see that on the pictures in the book and uh, that gets reduced a bit when you do your overcasting back but if you try and reduce it when you're making the stitch you end up just creating the stitch like it just goes smaller it doesn't go narrower the loop always kind of remains loopy rounded um, and you can see that a little bit in the air so but overcasting back does help with that and it sort of they tighten up a bit so I'm now at the end and I'm starting a new thread and I'm about to overcast back along this row now the overcasting especially in this stitch it's it's optional for the Spanish point but or at least open Spanish point but for this stitch this overcasting is essential because by it you secure and fix those stitches in their positions so I would go along a few, so you're going into each loop, oops, there it got caught and you can see what getting caught does, it sort of throws things out a bit. I would go along a few and then I would pull and I would straighten the stitches by pulling the overcasting thread straight, pulling it firm and tight and that would sort of straighten the row, help to straighten the row because it's not easy to get that row straight when you've got those stitches as they are. So there I am tightening the stitch. And you do that all the way back to the end and that is triple Spanish knit. It seems that I didn't get any footage when I was doing this shell insertion. According to the book, it's one of the prettiest of the insertions and it's formed using Spanish net stitches. So um, you, you go across the top, overcast down, and you do four Spanish net stitches into that upper loop and then to the side. Now, when you go to the side, you're sort of going further down than you normally would. And then when you overcast back, instead of Normally when you overcast back in Spanish stitch, you just go through once. But on these outer edges, you're going to overcast twice. And that holds these in place in the center. So you do two loops. If you needed to, I think over here I did three. It's a wider space. Two. And then keep overcasting back. Um, and then two on this gap. And then you overcast down. And then you form your next four. When you're going... To the second lot you're going into the middle of those four so um, yeah that's how the stitch is formed all the way down so your Spanish stitches go into the middle um, center of those stitches and then out and then you overcast a couple times before overcasting singly through and then overcast a couple times out and that is the shell insertion The book says, Greek net stitch is excellent for filling in large spaces and is often used instead of spiders and twisted bars for the filling in of the background of lace patterns. As the beauty of this stitch lies in the perfection with which it is made, absolute regularity in the length and spacing of the stitches is necessary. This is where I felt I didn't quite achieve that regularity and perfection in the spacing of the stitches. It's interesting that it's called Greek net stitch because it is actually a Spanish net stitch that forms it. The difference being that the space, the space in terms of the length of the stitch and the width of the stitch is much bigger. Um, but you're doing the exact same thing. And again, maybe I'm, I've got the error here with doing Spanish point when I should be doing Spanish net. Um, I'll one day find out. Um, so it's Spanish net stitch. And you're just leaving a bigger space in between and a bigger space for the, each row. So columns and rows, bigger. And because they're bigger, when you come back over casting, you do two stitches in each space. And that helps to keep the wide 
uh, the width in place. In the book, this stitch has a beautiful sort of hexagon look. I don't know that I really achieve that with mine. Um, but certainly, I think the overall effect from a distance, there's sort of a thickness to the stitch, and it's quite noticeable. And certainly in the future when I use it, I will do it probably not so much in a background space as in um, part of the lace pattern. Wheel stitch is a very enjoyable stitch to make. It's quick and easy, and according to the book, it can be used in large spaces. Uh, so it starts with diagonal lines across the space. So I didn't actually measure any angle. I just kind of gauged a diagonal line. You literally go through the other side of the braid and then you come back without twisting, without doing anything else, you come back to the other side and you don't go back into the exact same hole, you go right beside it. You want parallel lines across the space and then you go over to the next uh, set of parallel lines. I didn't, again, I didn't measure, I just sort of gauged it given the size of the overall space, how close I would do my lines. And you repeat those lines those double parallel lines and parallel all across the space. When you finish your first set of diagonal lines, you start your second lot of diagonal lines and they cross at a 45 degree angle to create right corners. Uh, the same method, you go down to one, the opposite edge, and when you come back up, that's when you start doing your wheels. So there's no tying of buttonhole knots between these. You just do a wheel and then go to the next one. You always cross over the single thread and under the double threads, which means that your wheels will start at a different side each time. So over the single threads, under the double threads. Now I'm going up to the next one and I'm going on the other side. And that's what happens when you go over the single threads under the double, it creates that sort of weaving of each wheel from one side to the other. And there's a, there's a looseness in that thread between them, but that gives the handmade stitch its beauty, I think. Point de reprise, or de reprise, I'm not sure which, is a very bold stitch and it's got a beautiful shine to it. But I warn you, it takes a long time to do this stitch. So um, I'll just quickly explain what I'm doing here before it gets into. So you go underneath, when you finish one, you go underneath the row of the lower one and up over the thread at the top of the triangle. Um, and that secures your thread before you start a new triangle. Um, so I created the, there's a few methods of how to create your triangles, but I did it what I thought was the easiest way, which was I drew lines in with one centimetre increments, horizontal lines going down. And then the book says to do 60 degree, uh, so to do parallel lines at 60 degrees from the horizontal lines. So I was very lucky to have a ruler with a 60 degree marking on it. Um, and that's how I drew in my, uh, the parallel lines, uh, parallel to the horizontal lines. And when all the triangles are in, you darn your cones. Each cone of the lower row of each successive row is in between the cones of the above row and it naturally falls that way when you've got your uh, lines in. So you darn all the way down and you make sure you push up with any darning, you have to keep pushing it up to make sure it's tight against the top and it doesn't come loose. And when you've darned all the way down and you're happy with um, the amount of stitches in the cone, you go underneath the row below, the thread of the row below, and over the horizontal thread of the top of the cone. And then you start your next stitch and you fill up the space in that way. And that is point de reprise.
Bruges stitch is a decidedly beautiful stitch and I was looking very forward to learning how to do this stitch. Um, it has the longest explanation of how to do it of anything you've ever seen in your life, which is why I left it till last. Um, but I persevered and I figured out and it's actually quite simple to do um, because of the space that I was doing it in. It took me probably five hours to complete this stitch in one cross area so a lot longer than I expected but it was very enjoyable um, it's essential that you draw your lines in and I used a ruler with a 45 degree um, line markings on it to figure out where my lines needed to go and I drew them half an inch apart and when all of those lines were drawn in I started my stitch so the first set of lines you go straight across from one side to the other and what I did was I went either side of the line the pencil line because you've got to have these lines about a millimeter apart or a sixteenth of an inch for those who understand inches so I went on either side of my line as a way to gauge that little gap of the two parallel lines when you come back in your first set of lines you're drawing you're creating little knots bruge stitches in between those square intersections so this is the first part you do a buttonhole stitch and then in that buttonhole stitch in it on it you do two more buttonhole stitches but you're going at a different angle as you can see you might need to replay that now it might look like I'm not in the middle and I'm not and it's because when you do this stitch it usually pulls over at this point it pulls to the middle see how it's it's not quite in the middle but it pulls over so I figured out that I've done my first stitch and now I'm doing my second I figured out that if I started forming the stitch more towards the upper side it would pull down on the lower side then you go immediately to your next square do your first buttonhole stitch and then you do your second buttonhole stitch sorry the next two buttonhole stitches inside that buttonhole stitch at that angle this is the one that uh, doesn't quite pull to the middle this is a mistake sometimes yeah, there you go <laughs> it didn't quite go over and at this point when it's fixed it's really hard like it's just annoying to try and undo the the knot so I just compromised when I did this overall if you don't do it too often it doesn't stand out so that's that's how you do the first rows of the bruise stitch just the buttonhole knots in between and then you overcast down to the next row For the intersecting lines in the other direction you do the same thing as before you go straight from one side to the other I did it just above and just below my pencil line to give it that little gap and the difference with this second lot of uh, parallel lines is that when you come back when you intersect the other lines you do a little rosy well actually you don't do a little rosy you've got the option of uh, you always do a buttonhole stitch there if you weren't to do a rosette you'd do two buttonhole stitches but I did do rosettes so I found one buttonhole stitch was sufficient and then I did a rosette so under over under over and one of my five hour sections I did because uh, it took me five hours um, I did just around twice but I found it looked much better to go around three times for these and actually I'm not just going under over under over those parallel I'm going in between so the first time I go around I went under the first lines because there's two sorry the first threads there's two every time you go except this last one there's only one then I went over the second round and then under the third round so in other words I'm going between the parallel lines when I'm forming the rosette Then you immediately go to your buttonhole stitch so as well as forming rosettes on this line you continue to form the knots in the in between of the squares in between the intersections you're still forming the knots so these lines these rows take longer because you not only have the knots you've got the the bruge knots you've got the rosettes as well what I'm doing there is your you can get the lines can get twisted so I'm actually straightening that because it's twisted over if I formed my rosette without straightening that it would have been twisted at some point along the row that I'm going along uh, the other parallel row 
and in that manner you form bruise stitch. There is something I'd like to show you. This is netting. Both of them are netting. This one is nylon netting. This one is cotton netting, 100% cotton. This is what I want to show you, the nylon. Without much, without much pulling, rip. Easily, easily rips. Rip it to shreds. <laughs> it rips so easily. This is the cotton, and I'm just going to take some of my scrap bits. So these are tiny little fragile pieces of the cotton. And pull, pull, pull. Oh, I had to pull really, really hard to get that to rip. So obviously you're not going to be doing that. But what I'm the point is, is that this is extremely strong, whereas this one isn't. <laughs> um, so I got my nylon. Uh, sorry. I ordered one yard of this, it's more expensive, but if you are putting it into lace that you've spent so much time on and that has value and is special and handmade, it's worth buying. This is fine cotton tool. Adding some net embroidery into my pattern was something of an afterthought and hence it's in a very small space, but it makes for a very cute Agnus Dei, Lamb of God. And uh, the inspiration for it came from seeing it being done, having been done in other Alps, and also some uh, hand knit embroidered lace had come through my hands, hand embroidered knit lace, and it was just beautiful. It wasn't until I came to do it myself that I realised how did they do that? Like how did they achieve those stitches and the variety of stitches when you've got, yeah, I just to this day I don't know how. Um, and I admire their work. I wasn't able in the time that I had to find out how to do that. Uh, the things that I found were not, they weren't um, fine work. They were very sort of basic embroidery stitches and uh, wouldn't have achieved what I wanted to achieve. So in the end, I just did something very basic, which was an outline, just weaving through like a darning stitch. I did that with the pearl cotton. And then I filled in the lamb with um, stranded cotton as I'll now show you. Having gone all the way around with the pearl cotton, I went with a single line of stranded cotton, same color, throughout the inside of the lamb. And this time, um, and I was very specific and very intentional when I drew my lambs that they were horizontal to the lines of the netting, because it meant when I did this part, I could just go back and forward. So just weaving in and out under one stitch and so from under over under over when your embroidery your embroidered net is pinned underneath and it's taut then you go around with your overcasting thread that's the cotton covered polyester thread in my case and you do an overcasting stitch so you go from the braid and you catch and what I did was I caught each loop I went in around each loop and caught it and the process of doing this made it nice and firm and flat within that area within that space it's tricky with the pins uh, it's tricky with two separate bits of fabric that you'll want to, especially with the the Battenberg lace above because that's very movable but it's very satisfying this part because it becomes firmly fixed in place so these inner stitches around the inner edge are the first part of attaching your net lace to your Battenberg lace. When the inner edge of the netting has been attached, you turn the work over and you cut the netting out just beyond the outer edge. So the outer edge of the braid where the netting will be, you go just beyond that. And you want to go beyond because you want enough to just do a little turnover so that your raw edge is tucked underneath. With that done, you then go around with the same thread if you've got enough still, go around the outer edge, tucking in the netting as you go. And I didn't go against, exactly against the edge, I just went close to the edge. I didn't worry about um, Sort of the length of these stitches I did them close together but 
they can't really be seen from the front. With this, you are tacking down the edging of that netting to the back of the braid. The most important part in terms of how this looks is that inner stitching which you did before into every single loop. With this, you're just sort of tacking down the back so that it's secure. And that is how you attach, or at least how I attached, the netting to my lace. At this point, there is nothing more exciting nor more delightful than removing the lace from the backing. I used an unpicker for mine, although I suppose you could use scissors, but this slides nicely underneath your hand done stitches, the machine stitches beside my fingers there, it take a bit more effort. You go around the whole piece and you remove all the threads, and I found that some of my threads had somehow been caught on the front sometimes, so that meant it didn't entirely come off just by this, I had to turn it over and free some of my threads from the lace threads very carefully. When I had finished my lace, I washed it. And to wash it, I soaked it in a hot solution of Oxy Action washing powder. Um, there's all sorts of brands for that. Uh, we've got a couple of here, here. But under no circumstances, put your lace in bleach. Um, I use this and it was perfectly safe. I soaked it for two or three hours and then I rinsed it three or four times without wringing it. I went, rinsed it till I was satisfied that the um, washing solution was, was gone. Then I rolled it in a towel and immediately after that, because I wanted my lace damp when I ironed it and I had time, I ironed my lace. And for that I used an ironing cloth on top and um, I just straightened, flattened it as best as I could with my hands, put the ironing cloth on top, and on the hottest iron setting, I ironed it, and it came out beautifully. Just some final thoughts. One is that the next time I make Battenberg lace, I'm going to use thread size number eight for the background areas. So I mentioned using, I used size 12 for my entire piece of lace. Next time I will use size 12 especially for these finer areas, but I will use size 8, the larger size, for the background areas. I think that will make them stand out more. The other thing is that I mentioned that the tape shrinks, and it does, but I had to order more tape, and the second batch that came did not shrink. So it doesn't really matter too much. Um, it's worth shrinking it anyway, but just to be aware that um, you might the tape that you get may not shrink, and that that's okay. The other thing is that in my next design, I'll have more space in between the areas. So things were this was a this vine was a second or third design vine. Next time, I'll have more space in between those areas, um, and certainly more space in in pieces like this, so that I can the lace stitches can really shine. Finally, uh, the finished piece is thirty one inches deep, and 76 inches wide in circumference. Actually on my pattern it was uh, 33 or 34 inches deep and 82.5 inches round. So that's just to say there was a shrinkage of a few inches both in depth and in width. Um, and finally it's not until your lace comes off that you see how it all works. Um, and in this one it's okay, but in one of these I I didn't catch these round bits here, and they're caught here, which is good. But you just notice when it comes off that that's helpful to do, to make sure on your points and your corners and your curves, you've got at least one of the lace threads catching it to hold it in place. Here, for example, look at that. Um, and what I might do is just with a small thread just connect that there uh, discreetly. So you don't know until you make lace how these things work, and um, you learn as you go. So happy lacing and God bless you.